ourselves. Pray you help us to die to ourselves, to live unto God, and to honor you each day. So help us, keep us clean for Jesus' sake. Bless the end of the service now. In Jesus' name. Let's sing. Bring your songbook and let's go. Page number 127. Jesus loves even me. Aren't you glad of that today? Page number 127. I am so glad that my Father in heaven. Good morning. Bless you. Thank you. Page number 127 in your songbooks this morning. Number 127. I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Number 550, channels only. Now I praise thee, precious Savior. Number 550 this morning. Number 550. How I praise thee, precious Savior. Number 573 this morning, I shall know him. Number 573. While you're turning there, we'll take care of some birthdays of this week. We have Wyatt Sparks today. Lydia, Lydia McCormick today. Cash Kelly on the 7th. Clayton Hardy on the 7th. Victoria Snow on the 7th. Justin Cronister on the 7th. I hope I got that right. On the 9th, well, here's one you got to watch out for. Reg Kelly. Mercy. Don Day on the 9th. Jewel Miller on the 10th. Laverne 
uh, Lebach, I believe, I hope, on the 10th. Uh, Dennis Martin on the 11th. Toby Jones, Bernadette Hoover, and Rhoda Joe Landis on the 12th. And that's all we have today, so let's sing to these folks. Lord bless you today. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you. Tomorrow is David and Elaine Klaus's anniversary. How many years? 37? 36. Okay. I was trying to give you an extra one. And Jay and Linda Fleetwood, they have an anniversary on the 9th. She told me this morning around 52, 53 or somewhere in there many years. It's true. That's what she told me. I don't know. Anyway, so we she's downstairs helping get him for the lunch after a while. So let's sing to all these anniversary folks. Happy anniversary to you, to Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you the whole year through. No choir practice tonight. No choir practice tonight. Number 573, I shall know him. Number 573. <clears throat> when my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and this smile be the first to welcome me. think about Fanny Crosby there who was blind when she wrote that. I can't imagine what she saw. I shall know him. Even though she couldn't see physically. But boy, when she got to heaven, she had perfect eyesight. Dear. Amen. Turn around and welcome folks today, but also have a word of prayer with someone today and be a blessing to one another.
Brother Dan's going to come in our scripture reading this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 today. I want to welcome everyone to church today. Lord bless you today. First Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. Would you stand please? When you find your place there, we'll read responsively through 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye are not of night, nor of darkness. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Pray without ceasing. Quench not the spirit. Prove all things. Hold that which is good. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, pray for us. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to I want to say clearly how much I appreciate all the people in this church that willingly serve without recognition or all that kind of stuff. Just want to serve the Lord and do what they can to make things happen. And uh, to reiterate what he said, there'll be a place down there they'll stop you. They've got your reservation, and um, there'll be a young man come get you, your family. They'll seat you. If you're here today and you're visiting, I want you to stay with us. We'll find a place for you. And if you have a daughter, we'll especially find a place for you, but feel welcome to do that. Brother Jason, just but but again, it'll help things to go smoother if you just if you go get somebody else to seat, you're liable to get evacuated. I don't don't, don't do that. Uh, I have a card here that says thank you all so much for your generosity in supporting our family as we go to Mexico. We earnestly covet your prayers for our family over the next six months while we are serving on night shift. If you wasn't if you wasn't at the if you wasn't at the Jubilee, you might not know what that's about. But there's a message preached on working the night shift, and it says, "Much love in Christ, Jason and Desiree Waltice and family." And I'm glad to see him go, but I sure hate to see him go. And I'm glad to see him go, and I sure hate to see him go. And I'm glad to see him go, and I sure hate to see him go. And Brother Jason, I would ask you, off the cuff, this way I operate, would you want to preach tonight? Could you preach tonight? I think you should. 
<laughs> He'll be preaching tonight. <laughs> and um, you know something you may not preach, maybe just kind of want to share your heart and some scriptures with the Lord. But Sister Lily's going to be going with them, laboring with them down there. Pray for her. And uh, just to reiterate a few things before we get into the message today. Uh, we have found a way, or it, the Lord has given us a way to help those that's been affected by the hurricane. If you're interested in helping, get a hold of Sean and Anna Hardy. Over your way over here. If you don't know who they are, ask somebody till you find them. And you'll find them. But he's going down. He'll be taking supplies, water, sleeping bags, other necessitating items for people that have lost their home and that are cut off from power and water and so forth. Okay? So that'll be great. As I said a while ago, uh, take your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Probably get ready to go here. Yes. Oh, I told you to remind me. Where'd you put them? All right. There's um, the boat no on amendment three signs by both doors. I didn't bring very many. If they're gone, they've got them at the pregnancy care center in Mountain Grove, a bunch. Okay. Or if you contact me, I can bring some more next week. All right. On the vote no, Amendment 3. And I'm telling you what, it would be a sin not to get out and vote. Amen. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is sin. Uh, the, this is a constitutional issue to this, this state. There are signs back there the sister brought. And if they're all gone and you want to put one up on your property or your business, whatever, and you can get more at the pregnancy center in Mountain Grove, or you can ask her and she'll bring some more. But we've got about four weeks till the election. And it's coming on us. And I'll tell you, folks, we're going to need all the votes we can get to beat St. Louis and Kansas City uh, out of this thing. So I encourage you to thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it a lot. Yes. There's some more signs over to Republican headquarters in Ava, Missouri. Get with Van on that if you need to do that. Thank you, Van. And just before I preach today, I want to say this. It's Daughters of the King Sunday. We started this last year. And... Uh, I don't know. I'm slow and hard-headed and all that. But last year, the Lord really burdened my heart about doing something special for the young ladies of this church. We are extremely blessed at this church. Amen. It's unreal to me what God is doing here and what he's done here. We just got out of the Jubilee, and I think, uh, what was there, seven or eight people baptized there at the last service. Just one of the sweetest services you've ever been in your life. And then this Sunday, getting to honor all these young ladies. Especially, We want to honor all women. Let me just tell you something. There's an attack on biblical womanhood like nobody's been in this country. has been on a full-scale attack from hell on biblical womanhood for years. And in this church, God being our helper, we're going to, we're going to help encourage biblical womanhood. And I want, I want every girl in this church house to listen to me. The Lord honestly does love you. The Lord made you. You're not an accident. And you're valuable. And America is going to go down without godly women. And we just want to encourage you today, let you know we love you, that you matter here at this church. Every one of you. And I do not want Satan implanting his lies into your mind that you're not special to God and not valuable to to this church and to your families and to this nation. And I mean that with all my heart. Now last year, I preached out of Psalms 144 where it talks about the daughters of the king. But this year, I'm going to preach about the king of the daughters. Okay? So that's what it's going to be. And Van, I had this message all laid out and he got up here and he was praying this morning and he said something about And he got it mixed up and he said, for this king, king of the daughters banquet. And when he said that, I thought, ding, ding, there's the title of my message. Because I am preaching on the king of the daughters. I've been asking ladies and young ladies all across church from outside early this morning to in here, are you a daughter of the king? If you're saved, you're a daughter of the king. And I want to tell you something. That's a pretty high calling if you ask me. And I just want to encourage you, let you know we love you. I'm not preaching to the girls or the ladies today. I'm preaching on the king. So here we go. Somebody, Bill, would you, could I, can I ask you to take this back to those men back there? I forgot to give them. And guys, you will have to go fast today and type fast. If you'll, if I preach fast, you can type fast. Amen. And so anyway, but I'm looking forward to that. I, I want to thank everybody for all your help at the Jubilee. 
all that goes into that. I want to thank everybody. There's people working right now down there preparing this food. And man, alive, I'm talking about the menu sounds good to me. And I just want to thank everybody in this church for all the work and labor that you do, whether it's considered little or much. It's important in God's work. Amen. All right. First Timothy chapter one, verse number 17. And uh, everybody there say amen. amen. First Timothy chapter one, verse 17. And uh, we're going to read this and then get right at it. And you pray that I preach fast. Would you do that? Because I do not want to keep a bunch of hungry people from the table. You're awful close to the food today, and there might be a food riot break out on me, you know, and I don't want that. Amen. I tell you, I'm, I'm glad to be happy in Jesus. Amen. I'm glad I can look higher than this old world and look at all the sad stories on the news. I, I, they don't know how to tell nothing good that I know about, hardly. All they know how to do is talk doom and despair and agony. That's about all they know, and that's what sin will do to you. But I'm glad we come to church worship the king this morning. And so here we go. Verse number 17, Paul is addressing Timothy in this pastoral epistle. And he's going to keep his focus on something. Now, here's what he says. Verse 17, now unto the king, capital K, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And right there's a good place to say amen. Amen. And so be it. Lord, we pray now you'd help us to preach with the unction of the Holy Ghost. I pray God help me to not worry a lick about what these people like or don't like. Help me, Lord, to preach the Bible. Help me to preach Christ as King, not just as a Savior, but a King. God deliver us from this modern gospel that wants a Savior, but not a King. I pray God today that it will be a life-changing time. As we look at who this king of the daughters is. And God help me to preach today. I pray, Lord, loose me in the power of the Holy Ghost to say everything you want said and nothing more and nothing less. And God, I pray today for those that are lost. They ain't nothing but daughter of the devil. And Lord, if sons of the saint, Lord, you, you talked about your father of the devil. And Lord, I pray today that they Get under Holy Ghost conviction and realize their guiltiness, that they're sinners like the rest of us. And they need forgiveness and they need mercy. And help them to know why Christ died. And I pray God do a work in them. Lord, do the work in them that you did in me. And I pray, Lord, help us not to monkey around and try to salve it all, salve it all up. Help us, Lord, just be straight and honest about the fact that we need a Savior. And He died on the cross and shed His blood and rose from the dead. And they believe on him, you'll save them. And Lord, deliver us from this modern churchianity, I pray in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray, come while I'm preaching today. In Jesus' name, Lord, I don't know what they'd do with all that food, but I pray you'd come anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis, now, I want to say a blanket statement today. I, I mentioned this during my prayer. But one thing that burdens my heart in America today is that everybody don't know more. And I, I'm glad you don't. Nobody wants to go to hell. And they want a Savior in a way not to go to hell. Yeah. But it seems like they almost don't even want to go to heaven. Uh -oh. But they realize they don't go to heaven to go to hell. So yeah, I'll, I'll take that too. But there seems to be a wall and a separation at that point. Yeah. All I want is a Jesus that will save me from hell. But he is not going to be my king. Uh -oh. I'm going to tell you something this morning you need to hear. The Jesus that saves is a king Amen. and he will not be your savior without being your king you can't have it both ways the problem is a lack of repentance and a lack of submission and a lack of realization you say well can't i be saved no. yeah you could if that's just in the ignorance but if you know who he really is yeah. and you only want him to save you from hell and you don't want a king to rule your life you don't have the gospel of this Bible. Amen. The apostle Paul who gave the gospel to the Gentiles is telling a preacher that's going to influence pastors for all time that this Savior that he mentioned in the early part of the chapter is not just a Savior, but he's a king. Yeah. He's a king. Yeah. And I want to get it in my heart. 
And I want to get it in this church. Let's stop this nonsense of having a little handyman Savior that's going to save us from hell. But He's not going to rule our life. And we can pick and choose what we want to do, what He says or not. And He does not rule our life. I don't like that. That's not biblical. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Genesis chapter 1. Man was given dominion. Verse 26, have dominion. And of course, you know the story. Man sinned and fell and the curse came. And Adam surrendered dominion. Satan gained a temporal and a locational dominion. And he is now called the God of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He is called a principality. And he's called also the prince of Persia. Whether you like, you wonder why everything is a mess, it is because there's a loose devil who has dominion temporarily and locationally, and he is the God of this world. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that prophecy, there would be two seeds. There would be a physical seed, Christ, and there would be an antichrist seed. There is a trail through Bible of the seed of Christ, and a trail through the Bible of the seed of the antichrist. But also, the Bible teaches us a spiritual seed, which is the Word of God, the incorruptible seed in 1 Peter chapter 1. Now in Genesis chapter 14, you will find the first mention of a king in your Bible. We have a problem in America. I love America. I'm thankful for our Constitution. Abraham Lincoln made that statement, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That sounds pretty good, but it's really not biblical. In the eternal perspective. It is government of God, for God, and of God, and about God. And God is to govern our land. Now I understand that I'm thankful that we have a right in this sin-cursed world to vote and to participate and that we're not under tyranny. Totally yet. Left up to Hillary Clinton and Kamaluhu Harris. I'm not going to pronounce her name like she wants it. I'm not going to honor her that way. She's a witch. She's of the devil. You say, I like you. Don't bring politics to living. Wait a minute. I'm just talking about a king. That's government. That's politics. Don't tell me separate politics and church. You're going to find you a penny ante preacher. You're going to find you somebody, but you're not going to come here and not hear the truth. That woman believes in slaughtering babies. She believes being a queer is all right. She believes in molesting children is all right. There's nothing filthy, nasty out of hell. That woman does not support. And she doesn't support you having the right to speak either. I'll tell you what, I'm about ready to preach, amen. We're a sick nation. And I'm not voting for her. You say they'll take away your 501. They can't. I ain't got one. Amen. Yeah, man. Amen. I've had enough of this stuff telling preachers to be quiet. Amen. Telling churches to shut your mouth and stay in the church house. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Yeah. The early American preachers preached. I'm telling you, they scald the hide of them tyrants. Yeah, yeah man. I'm talking this morning this, the first mention of kings is in the Bible through Genesis 14. It's going to tell you everything you need to know about it. you got a king of Sodom. A picture of Satan. God attaches Satan to Sodom. Then you've got a king, Melchizedek, king of Salem. He's a picture of Jesus Christ. So the Bible gives you two kings, only two kings that you can serve. And you'll serve one or the other. Jesus said, he that's not with me is against me. No man can serve two masters. And you say, well, the devil ain't my master. Yes, he is. If Jesus is not your master and Jesus is not your king, the devil's running your life. He's just got you full for a little while that you're running it. And the greatest stupidity you can ever get yourself indulged in is thinking that you're doing your own thing and you're against Jesus Christ. He just said this literally. If you're not for me, if you're not with me, you're against me. Amen. So you have those things. Abraham at that point in his life chose a king. And you're going to choose a king. And I encourage you to say, well, I don't like your rough preaching. I'll tell you what, devil don't either. Classify yourself. Amen. 
I'm just telling this right now. I'm in no mood. The day is late. The hour is dark in America. I'm in no mood to play games with this thing. I tell you, our country's at stake today. Our families, our our faith, our, our very Christianity, our very expression of speech is at stake. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Judah, uh, he, uh, J- J- uh, Jacob gives a prophecy of a king coming. He said it would be of the tribe of Judah. He said the scepter out of the king shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And Shiloh is a, na- a name of the Messiah. In Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17, even Balaam was used by God to make a prophecy concerning the coming king. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12 through 16, uh, Samuel gave a prophecy concerning a king that would come in. He gave, said he to be of the house of David, of the family of Jesse. It was a Davidic covenant, and he said he'll have a throne and he'll have a kingdom, and it will be forever. That was a prophecy concerning the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 24, we may come back to that later, but it's a prophecy of the king of glory coming in. In Psalm chapter 89, God again gives the Davidic king covenant, where he says that David will have to sit on the throne forever and forever. There is in your Bible, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, the prophecies of a king. It wasn't just a savior. It was a king that's coming. There's a song written, oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. Could I say to everybody listen to me this morning, the sound of my voice, the king is coming. The king is coming. If I could shout anything to the America, I'm not Donald Trump. The king is coming. Amen. That's our hope. That's our truth. That's our righteousness. It's not It's not anything else until the king comes. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, he said, I want to get in on it. And the Holy Ghost said, you can. And he prophesied of a king that will reign. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, he said, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Amen. That's a political figure that's going to rule the earth. In Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, he prophesied of a king that would come and rule this world after the tribulation. In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9, the Bible talks about a king. A ruler that would come. And then you jump from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And the very first thing nearly you read is the wise men came to find the Lord Jesus. And you know what they said? We've come to worship the King. Amen. They recognized that the Messiah, they weren't a bunch of soft belly. New, uh, 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 night to 2024, you can see where I'm at. 2024 soft belly Christians who only wanted a Savior to keep them from hell. Those wise men knew that they not he not only was a savior but they were actually lifted him up beyond that and said he's the king of kings and the lord of lords we came to worship the king of the jews the bible said the bible said in matthew chapter 21 verse 5 when jesus came on that colt and that referred back to the book of zechariah and he said behold thy king cometh it did not say savior it said the kings are coming and when you get into matthew chapter 27 and our lord's hanging on the cross and you could not recognize him his crown of thorns upon him his face battered more than any man his visage is more than the sons of man his back slaughtered with a tattered iron tails and his body and whipped and just recognizable and the blood's pouring you can see his heart beat through his flesh and bones and you know what they had up behind him on a, on a written above him king of the Jews all the way through it's about a king I want to lift this church I want to lift my own faith. He is my Savior. Bless God, He's my King. Amen. And He's not He's not my Savior that's at my whim. I'm going to tell you, He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And I'm telling you what, He's coming to reign with a rule of iron. Amen. A, a rod of iron. Now, a rod of iron's tough. You don't mess with a rod of iron. My daddy whooped me with a stick several times, a switch. He never whooped me with a rod of iron. My Lord Almighty, God comes back from the clouds. Let me tell you something. God ain't putting up with this nonsense. He's a holy God. I better get back to preaching. Amen. I want to tell you something right now. We better wake up and understand. I want you to put up uh, in John chapter 1, 49. He's called the king of Israel. But here's what happened. They rejected him in the sovereign 
prophetic knowledge of God as their Savior and their King. And God turned to the Gentiles and the church. And God ordained the church, which was a mystery in the Old Testament. And God brought Jews and Gentiles together who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their coming King. And the kingdom was put into mystery form, but there is a literal, physical kingdom that's coming to this earth where Jesus Christ of the seed of David will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And buddy, let me tell you something. I just don't think y'all to mess with them Jews. They love to blow your phone up in your face, amen. I thought that's about the funniest thing I ever heard tell her. Yes, sir, amen. And you say, well, I'm going to hide down it. I, I like it, amen. No, I'll tell you something. Right. You like it or lump it, I don't care. Israel is God's chosen people. And it don't matter about George Soros or any other Jew what he's doing. God is still sovereign over those people. He's going to work for the people. And I got tickled. That old right, right, sorry low down kid killing scoundrel thought he could hide in four layers of basement down there. And they sent them bunker bombers in after him. How'd they know he was down there? Huh? Can I tell you something? You know what God Almighty is doing? He's trying to put a picture in front of you. That he knows where you're at. He knows what you're doing. And you can't escape him. Amen. Amen. We better wake up and realize we ain't got some little Jesus who died on a little cross and you think he's your little buddy and going to save you from hell. I don't tell you something. We're going higher than that. Amen. We're going to the king. Amen. I don't tell you something. We ought to worship him. He's our God. He's our creator. He's everything to us. And I didn't come to church this morning to play games with you. I'm about 71 years old and I'm running on fumes. Amen. But I'll tell you, I'm going to blow the gasket out of my ring preaching the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Well, I'll tell you something. Listen, put up Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 11, boys, if you will. There's going to be a thousand year reign and rule of Jesus Christ on this earth. And then 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he's going to deliver up that kingdom to the Father. And then we'll enter the eternal kingdom where Jesus Christ is Lord. Now I saw heaven open. Woo! I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. He said, I don't believe that. That's why you ain't shouting, because you don't believe nothing. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful. Hey, I can I testify this morning. I've been preaching 41 years, or more, 42 years. He's been faithful to me, amen. I ain't been faithful, but he's been faithful. I'll tell you, he's faithful. And true. He's true, amen. I want to tell you something right now. I'm glad I'm serving the true God and the living God and the faithful God. And in righteousness, and in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Whoa, where's this sinful, queer looking Jesus on the side wall of your church? Long hair, little lace. It'll look like he just, he never touched nothing in his life. No, he's a man of war, amen. You better get him figured out who he is. You don't ever hear him preach in America as a man of war, hardly. You just don't. You just don't. But that's what your Bible said. His eyes were the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called... Word of God. Yeah. Quick, powerful, sharper than two edged sword. Yeah. And God said in Genesis, and God said in Genesis, and God said in Genesis. And the worst thing you'll ever do is not realize the power of God's word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. Amen. This book will save your soul. Amen. And the armies which fought were in heaven. I think that's us. I do. Because, see, we're going to be taken out way before this. We're going to be taken out seven years before this. We're going to be through the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ. And now God's going to say, mount up. <laughs> Woo! Mount up. Amen. Amen. And the armies in heaven followed in upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I'll tell you something. I've been made clean by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I have His righteousness, not my own righteousness. I'll tell you what He said. Out of His mouth goes the sharp sword that with it He should 
smite the nations. Yes. yes, sir. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, don't you think about that. He ain't putting up no nonsense. Ain't going to be no drag queen shows. There'll be no more public schools. Teaching our children that Genesis 1-1 is a stinking lie. That stuff makes me sick. They root this nation. They root this nation. They've taken the awareness and the fear of God and the knowledge of God out of the hearts of American young people. That's a fact. You mark it in your day book. You go to school then. He's who you're going to learn about. You ain't going to be reading Darwin. You ain't going to be reading Aristotle and Plato and all them other queers. You're going to be learning about Jesus Christ. Hey! Boy, I make you nervous. Does that make you nervous? Maybe you don't know the king. Maybe you've not submitted to the king. Come on, man. Come on. Amen. You listen to me. I am preaching that he is the king. Yeah. I am preaching this book. That's what your Bible said. Yeah. And he shall rule them out of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. I want to tell every Mormon. I want to tell every Jehovah Witness. I want to tell every Buddhist. I want to tell every Muslim. You better get a hold of Jesus Christ. He is the only one. He is God Almighty. And without Him, you'll die and go to hell. I'll tell every Baptist, every Pentecostal, every Nazarene. I don't care what your name tag is. You better know the King. Amen. I'm not mad at you. I'm not against you. But I'm telling you, there was a day when I was lost without God. And I did not know the King. Can I say to you, He has a right. Yes. Creatively yes. and redemptively yes. and sovereignly to rule this man's life yes. from my heart. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Christ is the last Adam the Bible calls him. And what he's going to do is reconquer and reclaim all that the first Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. And then the King Jesus Christ will deliver the kingdom up to his father. Jesus, our Savior. Yes, He's my Savior. Yes, He's my sacrifice. Yes, He's my substitute. Yes, He is my prophet. Yes, He is my high priest. But He is also my King. He is called the King of the Jews in Mark 15. He's called the King of Heaven in the book of Daniel. He's called the King of Saints in Revelation 15. He's called the King of Glory. In Psalms 24. And he's called the King of Kings. In that passage right there in verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of Kings. Lord of Lords. Brother I'm going to tell you something. When this thing's over with. Listen. He is not having a republic. He's not having a democracy. There will be no elections. There will be no impeachments. Amen. amen. I like it. Amen. amen. A righteous king. Amen. A glorious king. Amen. You say, well, what about him? I'm going to give you some descriptions and let you out of here. Number one in our text. We learn that this king is God Almighty. Yes. Jesus Christ is God. Look at your text in verse 17 at 1st Timothy, 1 Timothy 1. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, and visible, the only wise God. Please listen to me. This King is God Almighty. Yes, Lord. This King is God Almighty. Oh, yes. He is God our Savior. That's deity. The only wise God. This King is Almighty. As I said, He's our Savior, our sacrifice, our substitute, our Redeemer, and our Shepherd. But I'm going to tell you something right now. He's God. Amen. My King is my God. Yes, the King is the God. Yes, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yes. Born of a virgin. Amen. Amen. Baptized in Jordan. Yes. Preaching in Israel. Yes. Uh, died on the cross. Yes. Shed his blood buried. Rose from the dead. Yes. Ascended back to heaven. Seated to the right hand of God. Yes. And coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. Yes. Number two. He's not only God Almighty. He is eternal. Yes. Look at your text there. Now unto the king. I want to reiterate this again. Because I don't think he was listening to you. 
Apostle Paul yeah. is talking to a pastor. He's giving pastors down through the church age yeah. instructions how to instruct the people of their churches. And he is emphatically telling him, you don't just preach him as Savior. Yeah. You preach him as King. Yeah. He is He is. He is to rule their lives. He is to rule my life. He is king. Now I'm going to say something to you. American culture can really get you messed up right here. Because, well, I'm an American. I'm free. I can do what I want to. You better get your sights a little higher. You can't do just what you want to with God. If you're saved, if you're really saved... And you disobey him, chastisement is coming to you. If you don't get chastised, he literally says in his book in Hebrews there that you're not his. That's what he says. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal. He had no beginning and there ain't going to be no ending. There never was a time when he wasn't. Got that? Three big questions every young person in America needs to hear and hear the answer to. Where to come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? If you can answer those three questions, you'll have a successful life. If you can answer those questions biblically, where did I come from? You came from God. Come on. God's the one who gives life. Knew you before the foundation of the earth. Why am I here? To bring Him glory. To live for Him. To honor Him. To bless His holy name. To be a representative, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Where am I going? Depends on what you do in Jesus Christ. Yeah. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You either saved or lost. You either going to heaven or you're going to hell. Amen. Plain and simple. Amen. Those are three things everybody ought to know. God wants you to know it. Amen. Now, he not only that. He's the self-existing eternal one. Yes. Nobody, he depends on nobody. He, didn't, he ain't worrying about it. I'm telling you something. About it. Let me throw this in at you right now about this eternal king. He gives eternal salvation. Yes. He's the author of eternal salvation. And if your Jesus is the author of temporary lose it salvation, you ain't got the right Jesus. Because Jesus of the Bible is the author of eternal salvation. Amen. How can he do that? Because he is eternal. Amen. And he gives eternal life. Some of y'all just shut. You've had a rough week. Everything in the world, your doses are tore up, your car went flat, your kids have got diarrhea, and everything else is going wrong. And y'all just jump up and shout and say, bless God Almighty, I've got eternal life if I ain't got anything else going for me. Amen. You say, well, you're all excited about this. You better believe it. I'll tell you something. I've given my life 40-something years to the cause of Christ, and it's getting tweeter and tweeter, and I believe it's going to turn into tugger after a while. Amen. It's good. Amen. It's good. Amen. I love him. I'm thankful for him. The closer I'm getting to glory land, I'll tell you what, I believe there's some mornings carrying my wife. There are some mornings I believe I can look and see the glow of the city. I believe, Brother Lonnie Latham, sometimes that's like God said, Reggie, I'm going to give you a little, little glow of the glory. Man alive. I didn't come up here to play church, amen. I came up here to worship the King. And if you get in that kind of shape, you'll be anxious for next Sunday. Now, I ain't going to lie to you. See me like nowadays, Sunday flips off a fast. Yeah. But it seems like God always gives me the bread when I need the bread. Amen. But he's God. Secondly, he's eternal. Thirdly, your text tells you he's immortal. That's in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15, 16. What's the mean immortal? Well, i tell you what, this hillbilly wasn't sure about it a few years ago. So I went and looked it up. It says this, having no principle of alteration <laughs> or decay. <laughs> I tell you, I went back to 1 Corinthians 15 where it says, and this mortal shall put on immortality. 
I said someday this decaying body is going to put on a body that will never have any alternation. It will never have no decay. And my king is a God who is immortal. Amen. He said, I am a resident. He said, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. That means he's exempt from death. And can I tell you something? If you hear I died, you tell them that's not true. Because I've got eternal life and I'm just moving. I'm just moving out. Amen. Oh, I tell you what. I'd be more timers used to sing some glad morning. I tell you what. I'll fly away. And they didn't just get that. They got that out of Psalms chapter 90 where Moses said, he said our days are three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they're eighty, he said we're going to fly away. Amen. And when this, when I, I ain't a dying, I'm just moving out. Amen. Yes, Why? Because I got a king yes. who's immortal. Hey. Amen. And I'm exempt. Yes. <laughs> ain't going to be no alteration. Yes. I got eternal life. Amen. Yes. Then I got to tell you something it says in the text. You probably didn't see this. He's invisible. Yes. <laughs> Now, I want, how many would like to know how to endure hard times? Anybody be interested in that? Sure. Reggie, I'll tell you, I've been going through tough. I'll tell you, everything world been happening up one side, down the other. How about time you think things is good, everything goes out? Moses, listen to your Bible. Endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, let me get that one more time, Lord. Moses... You endured all that you went through because you saw somebody. But that somebody you saw, you can't see. (laughs) No man has seen God at any time. But the Son hath revealed Him. And I'll tell you what I can do. I've read that book. And sister, I see God. And I see Jesus through the eye of faith. And I endure as seeing him who is invisible. And if you want to endure the trials and the troubles and the problems of your life, you learn to read this book and you say, God, open my eyes and see you. And God will open your eyes and you'll see God and you'll go good land of living. This ain't too bad. I can go through this. Oh, you bunch of Presbyterians out there. You need to get right with God. Amen. He's invisible, amen. The Bible said he's the blessed and the only potentate. I hate to tell the Pope this news, but he ain't no potentate. I hate to tell that little rascal with an apron around his front down at the Masonic Lodge, but you ain't no potentate. And you ain't no worshipful master. And you little boys down there at the Masonic Lodge playing your little stupid game better wake up. Because you won't say the name of Jesus in your lodge. Unless you change your ways. And you got a lie open and waking coming. Oh, did that ruffle your little feathers? Did that ruffle your little feathers? You better get right with God. Don't you talk to me about that slop. You go take your first degree of Masonic laws, they'll bring you in blindfolded and tell you they're taking you to the light. And they'll get you in there and they'll say, We're going to kneel now and pray. And they're going to pray their little prayer. And they're going to say, now you're going to have your blindfold taken off and you come into the light. And you take your blindfold off and you'll be kneeling before what they call their worshipful master. Idolatry to the sickest core. Don't you ever talk about worshiping Mary if you're a mason. Yes, sir. I lost, I couldn't even count how many friends in this part of the country. And they hate my guts. And they hate this church because I had the audacity to preach against an idolatrous practice. Yes. How many of you want to come up here this morning and get me up here in a big fat chair and say you'll worship down before the worshipful master? That's idolatry. And I got news for you. You better straighten up and ask God to forgive you and repent of that and get out. Because he, Jesus Christ, is the only one. I have no king but Jesus. I apologize. And may I just say this for extra, free for nothing? You 
pity any preachers who won't preach nothing. You're scared to death. You're controlled by me and you make me sick. I think you make God sick. You try and stay on the good side of everybody under the auspices of, well, I don't want to ruffle feathers. I'm just trying to win them all Jesus. Oh, really? No, the real truth about you is you're scared. You're scared. You're just a coward. Won't you admit it? This week, some penny any preacher, I ain't going to say his name, got on Facebook. He started off scouring these pharisaical preachers who preach on uh, the Bible. Said, you're going to get up, you Pharisee preachers, and preach on Bible versions this week. And you're going to preach on dress. And you're going to preach on this and preach on that. You're a bunch of Pharisees. I just tell them about Jesus. Oh, really? No, no, no. You're missing. I, you're supposed to preach the word, who Jesus is, and all the counsel of God. And you can't preach the word without preaching about the word. Go to your, go to your concordance and see how much God says about his word in the Bible. No, I'm going to tell you about you. And you may be listening to me. You're wrong. You're scared. You're trying to jimmy up why you won't preach on stuff. Because you're trying to get all them people in your church and give off. And so you ain't going to preach on stuff that you think might cause folks to leave. That's the truth about you. Oh, you're getting in the fighting mode. Well, the Bible said fight the good fight of faith. Amen. I thought he said, be a good soldier of the cross. Amen. I don't hate nobody, but I'll tell you one thing. Don't throw them lies in my face. I'll tell you what, I'll come back at you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm serious with you. Uh, listen, he died for me. He kept me out of hell. He gave me life eternal. He gave me the truth. I'm telling you something. I'm not going to I'm not gonna sell him out now. Amen. He's invisible. Well, I'm going to get on past some of that. Colossians 1 7 says he's the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus Christ. Philippians said he's equal with God. Jesus said, He that has seen me hath seen the Father. John 1 18 says, No man has seen the Father at any time, but he said, I've, he, he said I, You see me, you've seen the Father. Let me give you the fifth thing. He's not only all that God and invisible and immortal, he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. Bible tells you back, and I, I, you dear Mormons, I tell you what I'm praying for. I want you Mormons to hear me. You may think I'm that. You may hate my guts. But I'm praying that the Mormon church north of Mountain Grove will all be converted to Christ. I'm praying that your Mormon bishops will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he's who he says he is. You're wrong about him and you know it. You know it. And I want you to be saved. I'm not against you. God's for you. But you're going to have to repent of disbelieving who Jesus Christ is. See, preaching like this makes folks uncomfortable. And that's why folks will ease themselves out after a while. Because it makes them nervous when somebody walks up and says, I saw Reg Kelly on Facebook and he's a preacher on this and preacher on that. And you kind of get, uh, well, uh, you know, Reg does get kind of wound up once in a while. <laughs> yeah, I know how it goes. Why don't you tell him, go talk to Reg about it. <laughs> and by the way, where's he wrong at? I mean, where did he preach something false? I, you know, why don't you go to him and say, Reg, you're right here in the Bible. It's something you, you contradicted that you're wrong about that. I, I'll be glad if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But he's Emmanuel. Lord, help me get off all that. God with us. The reason I said that, because they, they claim to believe the Old Testament, G, talking about Jesus' virgin birth there, is that God with us. Chapter 9 goes ahead and talks about this virgin born son and said the government will be upon his shoulder. What it's given you is both the Savior and the King telling you the whole deal about the gospel of God. Well, the next thing he is, he's incorruptible. Oh, I like this. He's eternal, he's immortal, he's invisible, he's incorruptible. He's the uncorruptible God. You say, Reggie, what's that mean? That means he's not capable of corruption. Now I want you to get a hold of something. Were our Lord capable of being corrupted? You would not have a savior. When the Bible says that he's incorruptible, you better latch hold of that. Because if he's not, you don't have a savior. That means that he's incapable of corruption. He's incapable of deterioration. He's incapable of decay. He's incapable of sin. He is sinless, the stainless, spotless Lamb of God. His righteousness can never be tainted. We have an incor uncorruptible God who is thrice holy while you and I are in church right now 
There are beasts around the throne yes. who with their heads bowed and their wings out who cried night and day, Holy, 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 Holy. holy. While well, you're in church this morning. You want to worship God? Amen. You want to worship God? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, now here's what I like part of that. This uncorruptible king makes incorruptible saints. Amen. Amen. You say, when I read you, I still sin. I know you yeah. do. But in 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 tells you that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and he cannot sin. Why? Because he does good? No, because he's born of God. That's why you've got to be born again. Because when you're born again, God creates a brand new man. A brand new man inside. Born of the Spirit of God. This is where some of you is going to flip now. You're going to have to get hold of this. Born of the Spirit of God. And that new man cannot sin. I just said, your Bible says that. Check me out. 1 John chapter 3 verse 19. What's that mean? Incorruptible. That's why you can have eternal life. When you've been born again. God gives you eternal life. And it's incorruptible life. And it can't decay. can't deteriorate. can't fade away. But oh my goodness. It gets tweeter and tweeter. One of these days. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul said. That this corruptible. Will put on. Incorruption. I'm going to have a new glorified body. That will never know sin again. It will never know deterioration again. And I'll have a body fashioned like in the body of my Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, I've got an incorruptible God who's got an incorruptible book who makes incorruptible saints. Amen. Can I wait a minute? You didn't hear that. I said he has an incorruptible book. I, listen, I love you all, but I feel like I'm preaching at the devil right now. Sometimes he comes in, you know. Yeah, come on. Yeah. And if I get all raggedy and kind of tough, they just yeah. say, well, the devil must come in on it. God, I love you. Yeah. I want you to go to heaven. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be happy. But I'm preaching in some Bible truths today. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If God's word's no good, he's no good. Yeah. If God's word is corruptible, he's corruptible. Yeah. He literally told you in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the incom- you're born again by incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Yeah. I'm going to do me a hallelujah dance. Amen. I got an incorruptible God. I have an incorruptible book. He made an incorruptible new man. Woo! Well, I like this because the devil don't like us to have a good time. Amen. He wants to set their dignity. Theological giraffes. I ain't got no time for that nonsense. Amen. We have an incredible book now. I'm going to finish up here. He's an infallible king. He can't sin. Ain't possible for him to sin. He cannot sin. <laughs> He's don't have, he don't make no errors. Well, if you didn't hear Jim's message Wednesday night, you need to get back on Facebook and listen to that. You need to hear that about God being for you. There, he, he has no errors. He makes no mistakes. He's the infallible king. He has an infallible book. <laughs> then they have an immutable king. You say, Reggie, what's that mean? That's a big word. Well, this hillbilly had to go look it up. It means he don't ever change about nothing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I, I ain't got to worry about God getting tired or changing his mind. Amen. God is not changing himself. He's not changing his word. He's not changing his love. And you better thank God he ain't changing his salvation. And he ain't changing about hell if you don't get saved. Let me tell you another thing about God. This king, he's exclusive. I said he's exclusive. I said the only wise God. That means there ain't no others. This is where the rub comes. Oh, you got your, George Bush saying, well, they've got their God and we've got our God. They're all the same gods. The Pope the other day, how many knows what the Pope said the other day? He just put out a statement week, about a week and a half ago that the God of the Muslims, the God of the Buddhists, and the God of the Christians are all the same God. Yeah, he said it. Check me out on that. 
I got news for you. Their God is not our God. The Jesus Christ of this Bible is exclusive salvation, exclusive King. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by me. The Bible said, neither is there salvation in any of them. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. He's exclusive. Oh, you say, I want to be tolerant. You know what your problem is? You don't love. Because if you loved them people enough, you'd tell them the truth. Your problem is, you, 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 you're, oh, I'll tell you what, this woke council culture makes me sick to my stomach. That's out of the bowels of hell. Won't you, have you, I want to ask you a question. Did you love anybody this week enough to tell them about Christ? Did you love God enough to stand against wickedness where you had a chance to? Or are you a wimp? He's exclusive. It didn't say anybody else's name. It said at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. At the name of Jesus. Nobody else. That he is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> you know some of his problem? You're trying to get along with this world too good. Yeah, you know, you, you kind of love God and you're sure glad Jesus died, but you, you kind of like to get along with the world and you would not want to be ostracized because of the stand you take. You just, you just kind of like getting along with everybody. I want to ask you a question. Did your Savior who died for you get along with everybody? No. Let me tell you about him. He didn't get along with everybody so to the point they put him on a cross. Wow. You just well get honest about it. Yes, sir. Yep. That's right. The apostles? Was their goal to get along with everybody? No. no. They got along so bad with everybody that all of them suffered horrible deaths. <laughs> the saints of God before you who were burned at the stake fed to the lions do you think they were just, their goal in life was to get along with everybody you know and just kind of no. get along with everybody no let me tell you what's wrong with Christianity in America it's not the queer so much it's not all this other stuff we've decided we've bought into the woke culture lie yep. that as Christians we want we should be liked by everybody yeah. and get along with everybody and it's a lie that's killing this country. It is not my job as a preacher to get along with everybody. I have not read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. My job is to preach this precious old book. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word shall not pass away. Grass withereth and the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Do you listen to me? I'm not in this for money. And I never have been. And if I did not believe what I'm preaching to you with every ounce of my soul. If my goal was to get along, I've lost, I've lost a lot of friends. And I've lost a lot of family. Because I would not bow on the issues of this book. And I don't brag about that. I'm just saying that's how it goes when you stand upon the word of God. He's an infinite king. Glory forever and ever. That means he's limitless. There's no ceiling to his knowledge. There's no bottom to his wisdom. There's no depth of his love. There's no limit to his mercy. And there's no shortage of his grace. He is an infinite king. But in closing, I want to say this finally. He is a glorious king. I want the pianist to come. And when we're taught to pray, <laughs> in Matthew chapter 6, Thine is the glory. Thine is the glory. I'm telling you, say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I want you to put up Psalms 24, boys. Verse number 7. I want you to look at this as we close out as the pianist comes. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of 
glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord. Capital O, capital R, capital A, D. Strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. That happened to me in a spiritual sense on January the 24th, 1982. I opened the gates to my soul and the king of glory came in. But there's going to be a day on the east side of Jerusalem and the gates of Jerusalem. I wish I had a photo to show you the gate, eastern gate of Jerusalem this morning. But if I could paint you a picture, it'd be this. you see this great big wall. And you'll see these arched gates and they're all cemented up and bricked up, closed up. People don't go in and out of the eastern gate over there. And then, guess what they did? The Muslims did. See, the Muslims know that Jesus Christ is a high priest, supposed to be. And he's not supposed to touch the dead or be around the dead. See, the priest? So guess what the Muslims did? They made a graveyard out in the front of the eastern gate. And they said, that's going to keep Jesus from coming back. That's what they believe. They said, we're going to seal that gate door up. We're going to concrete that thing, block it off. Nobody can get in or out of it. And then we're going to bury people from the wall out about 200 yards and 300 yards. And they got people. It's a cemetery. Let me just tell you something. The king of glory is coming. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And he's going to come out of the eastern sky. And let me tell you something. He's going to come through. He's going to land on Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of the eastern gate. He's going to come down across Brook Kidron. And them doors are going to open. I promise you they're going to open. And if somebody has to shovel them graves out of the way, he's going to walk through, amen, through the eastern gate. And the king of glory shall come in. Verse 10. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Revelation chapter 19, and I saw armies in heaven with him, the Lord of hosts, and he makes war and battles and destroys the Antichrist. He winds up throwing the devil in the bottomless pit and wind up in Revelation 20 where he casts Satan into the lake of fire. He's a man of war. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And while the pimps is here, let me give you this and say this to you. He's glorious in his wisdom. I've never read any book like this book. If you want to know the truth and you want to know wisdom, right here's this book. You want to really know what's going on in this world? Read this book. He's glorious in not only his wisdom, but in his power. He's able to save to the uttermost. And he's able to conquer Satan and hell and death and grave. He's powerful. He said all power is given to me in heaven and earth. He's glorious in his beauty. The Bible speaks of seeing the king in his beauty. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Have you ever thought about what it's going to be like to see Jesus? When Thomas saw him, Thomas said, put your hands in my side feel did you know that your Jesus has scars on his face that he has scars on his back that he has scars and I think of that old story I heard years ago about a daddy whose thumb was burned off and fingers stubbed down from being burnt and they never would tell the little son he'd say daddy what happened to his eyes don't worry about it son Daddy got sick to dying. And the mother said, called him in and said, Son, I don't think your daddy's going to make it. There's something I want you to know before he dies. When you was a little baby, our house caught on fire. Your daddy run in the house, went through the smoke and he went through the flames, grabbed a blanket, throwed it around you and his head and came out of that house. But in doing so, burned his hands he said I want you to know why your daddy's hands are burnt and they say that little boy went into his daddy's deathbed and said daddy 
Can I see your hands? And his daddy raised his hands up and the little boy took his hands and he kissed him. And he said, Daddy, you've got the most beautiful hands in the world. Can I tell you this morning that my Savior may be scarred, but he's got the most beautiful face in the world to me. He's got the most beautiful hands in the world to me. The king in his beauty. The king in his wisdom. The king in his truth. And the king in his holiness. The king in his righteousness. The king in his truth. I tell you, I was working on this message and I said, God, if there's anything I want to thank you for today, that's your truth. Where would we be without truth? Where would we be without truth? I want to ask you a question today. Where can you hear truth? Where can you hear truth in this world? Sometimes truth is hard to bear. Sometimes truth is hard to receive. And we get our little attitudes and we get our little wedges and so forth. And so we reject truth because it doesn't come from somebody that we like their personality. But I'm going to tell you something. You can't say that about Jesus. He is truth. He's glorious in war. My, how I will be happy to be riding behind my Savior. And see him conquer the armies of Satan. To see him put down all principality and power and the hatred of this world toward him. And I will be tell you he's glorious in victory. He's glorious in his death. There is, I have never in my life thought anything so glorious that the Son of God laid down his life for me. What glory. He's glorious in his resurrection. He's glorious in his life. He's glory in his abundance. He's glorious in his forgiveness. Do I get? I have totally given up on Reg Kelly. But I haven't given up on Jesus. Reg Kelly is a sinner. Reg Kelly should have been in hell. Reg Kelly at his best day is filthy rags. But oh, I tell you, I've got a Savior that's holy. I have a Savior that's perfectly righteous. And it's glorious. He's glorious in his creation. He's glorious in his redemption. He's glorious in his mercy. He's glorious in his grace we serve a glorious king I want to ask you some very quick questions and close he is the king he is coming but I want to ask you this question is he honestly not just your savior now you listen to me I'm not getting into lordship salvation I want you to get that but the honest truth about it is he's lord whether you make him lord or not okay And he is king, whether that absorbs into your mind and your heart or not. But I can tell you something. If there's an attitude in you that I only want him for Savior, but I do not want him as my king, I'd be scared of that. I'd I'd be scared to die in that condition. Now I mean it. Because the Apostle Paul was telling Peter, you don't just tell these people he's their Savior. You tell him he's the eternal, immortal, invisible king the only wise God and then I can say something it's not a problem for me to serve a king and obey a king that I love and I love him I may not be a good Christian but I love him I love him he first loved me I'm glad he loved me when I was drunk I'm glad he loved me when I was immoral. I'm glad he loved me when I was a hypocrite. You better be glad he loves you. He's glorious. He is our king. Is he your king? Is he your king? Is he the king of your heart? Is he the king of your home? Is he the king of your marriage? 
Is he the king of your mind? Is he the king of your mouth? Is he the king of your vocation, your job, your business? Is he the king of your education and your learning? Is he the king of your entertainments and your pleasures? Is he the king of your appearance? Is he the king of your wardrobe? Is he the king of your activities? But deeper yet, is he the king of your motives? Is he the king of your attitudes? And have you bowed to the king? Guys, I want you to put up the last verse, Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 31 and 32. Now I promise you I'm coming to the close. But I want you to see these verses. Please read them. They come unto thee as a people that cometh. And they set before thee as my people. And they hear thy words. But they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo... Thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on instruments. They hear thy words, but they do them not. This is Ezekiel writing to Israel in the midst of the judgment of God about captivity. Are we coming to church and we like the preaching, we like the singing? We enjoy the fellowship. And we hear the words, but we're not going to do them. We're not going to do them. I love you. With our heads bowed and eyes closed today, I wonder if there's people here that say, Reggie, I'm, I've been saved. I've been saved. But God has made me see something this morning that I need to make sure Jesus is the king of my life in reality in reality and you want to make that commitment to God I want to tell you something I bowed my head before God and I said Lord forgive me for just wanting you as a savior Lord I want you as my king I want you to determine every area of my life I know Lord that I'll never be perfect this side of eternity but Lord I I want you as my king I don't want Reg Kelly as my king That'd be a train wreck. I sure don't want the world as my king. And I sure don't want the devil as my king. I want you, Lord, as my king. I wonder if you'd slip out of your seat. Might be one. Might be two. Might be a dozen days. Say, God, you are my savior. But Lord, I want to make sure that you know I want you as my king. Because you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you come? Lord, I want you as my king. You may be out there today and you're not saved. Oh, let me tell you, the King's coming. You need Christ as your Savior. God bless you as you come. God bless you. I'm going to tell you something. I believe with all my heart, God honors this deeper level of understanding, this deeper level of commitment, this deeper level of obedience. I know It'll make a difference in your life if Jesus is your King. I wonder if there's somebody here to say, Reg, I'm not even saved, much less, he's not my savior, much less my king. Would you, right now, bow your head before God and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Would you ask God right now to save you? Would you right now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sin? Would you believe the gospel today that Jesus died for you in your place for your sin? Any others want to come this morning? I know it's getting a little bit late. I promised the people cooking that I'd try to get them out there an appropriate time. I want Christ to be my king. It'll make a difference. It'll make a difference in your life. Oh God, Jesus, you are king. And I accept that and I acknowledge that and I embrace that. You're my king. Before we leave today, and before heads are, as heads are bowed, eyes closed, is there anybody in this building say, Reg, I came to church this morning. I'm not saved. I've never been born again. I'm not a Christian. And I'd appreciate prayer. I want you to know something. I'm not going to 
harass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not trying to do any of that. But I want, to, I want you to try to lead you to Christ. I will tell you that. This won't save you, but I do want to know how to pray for you. And it would be good if you just acknowledge your need of salvation. Would you slip a hand up high where I can see it? And I'll acknowledge that and pray for you. Anywhere in the building. I see that hand. God bless you. And that hand there. God bless you. Is there another hand? Anywhere in the building. High where I can see it. I don't want to miss you. Amen. My king. My king. My king. The Lord Jesus Christ. The king of kings. And the Lord of lords. Let's stand together. Father in heaven. Oh God. It is good for me to think. About the second. That my spirit leaves my body. It is good for me to remind myself of the shortness of this life, the frailty of my body. It is good for me to know and remember that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Lord, it is good for me to think often about how Jesus died for me on the cross. How that he was buried and rose again the third day. Lord, these two raised their hands for prayer. I lift them up in prayer to you now that they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Believe in his death and his burial and his resurrection. Believe that he died in their place for their sins. God, that they would be brought to the throne of grace and mercy and call on the name of the Lord and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, it's also good for me to think about the King. It's good for me to think about the kingdom. It is good for me to think about that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. It is good for me, Lord, to think about that you're coming back in power and glory. And Lord, that you will wage war in righteousness and in judgment. And that you will smite the earth. And that you will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years with a rod of iron. God, forgive us for only wanting your Son as our Savior. Enable us to embrace him as our king who rules in righteousness but who also rules in justice and in mercy. God, we pray for the coming of your son. There is no hope apart from him for this earth. Lord, remind us every morning that someday we will meet the king. God, I pray now, bless our time of fellowship. Bless the food and bless those that prepared it and those that worked and labored so hard to prepare this wonderful time. And Father, I'd ask you this morning before we close, would you please bless the daughters in this church? I ask you, God, to bless them with a deep and abiding and divine love for you. A love that would control their emotions, a love that would control their fears, their worries, a love that would conquer the world's lies to them and about them, a love, God, that surpasses all understanding. And I pray, God, that in this church, these girls would not attempt to be like the world. They would see it for what it is. It's a lie and a joke. It is a trap. I pray, God, that you'd give them purity of heart, purity of mind, cleanness of soul, 
And that God, that you'd give them the desires of their heart. Lord, bless them. Thank you for blessing these families and this church with all of these wonderful blessings of daughters. Again, Father, I pray bless this food now. God, give us a good time in the Lord. May there be good memories in the minds of these young people of the time that they spent at church. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Love you.